We're going to be continuing our Old Testament study, and uh, we're going to be looking at another uh, very infamous prophet uh, through the through Old Testament, Elisha. Sounds a lot like Elijah because it's very similar, and uh, he is a predecessor to Elijah. And uh, we're going to look at him in detail this evening. We're going to cover one of the lar- the I guess the larger events. Uh, pretty uh, interesting story here and uh, draw some conclusions from from what we can learn from this story and other events in his life and uh, then we'll basically conclude so this is still during the divided kingdom period Um, the king of Israel at this time is Jehoram and the king of Judah at this time is uh, King Jehoshaphat and uh, Elijah the story of Elijah goes through 2nd Kings chapter 2 well, you were introduced to him earlier than that, but anyway, Second Kings two through thirteen, you see him pretty heavily. That's where the meat of his presence is. Um, but first, let's go to uh, basically in the initial starting point where we're introduced to Elijah. That's at First uh, Kings chapter nineteen, uh, starting there at verse nineteen, and this is where Elijah, um, basically near the end of his ministry, or not too far from it, um, basically. Uh, converts Elisha to to train with him to become to, to become his predecessor. There, First Kings nineteen and nineteen, talking about Elijah here. So he departed from there, and found and found Elisha the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the twelfth. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, "Please let me kiss my father and mother, then I will follow you." And he said to him, "Go back." And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? So Elijah turned back from him, took a yoke of oxen, and slaughtered them, and boiled boiled their flesh, using the oxen's equipment, and gave it to the people, and they ate. And then he arose and followed Elijah, and became his servant. That's where we're first introduced to Elijah. And see here that he was a committed man. He, He asked quickly to Elijah, Let me go say bye to my parents, and you know, get things in order, and he was willing to go, but Elijah said, what did I do to you? Basically testing him to, to come on, and he did. He, he did just that. He turned around to the, the oxen that he was using to plow the field and offered, slaughtered them, offered them as a sacrifice, and never turned back. And from that point forward, he was uh, uh, traveling with Elijah and learning from Elijah. And uh, William t- read this. I'm not going to read all of it that he read, but a few of the verses there in Second Kings chapter 2. Verses 8 through 14, this is basically the, uh, the end of Elijah and the, uh, the beginning of Elisha's, uh, I guess, work as we would call it. So 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 8. This is uh, right before Elijah is about to be carried up into heaven. Um, Elisha and Elijah are walking together here. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 8. Now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water, and it was divided this way and that, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be, on, be upon me. So he said, You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be, be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened as they continued and continued on and talked, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven, and, Eli- and Elisha saw it, and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. And he also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, struck the water, and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elijah crossed over. And from this point, um, we see Elisha taking on that role, being the, the primary prophet spokesperson person of this time. And he became a very great and powerful uh, prophet. Um, he did a lot of miracles. I, Maybe with the exception of Moses, you might say, did more miracles, but um, he did do, I would say, more miracles recorded than Elijah, and probably up till the time of Jesus, performed more miracles than, than any other prophet. 
Um, we're not going to read, read all of these or really look at any of these, but I'm going to list some of them. This is not all of them. But uh, he heals the water of a city. Um, he miraculously um, creates this jar of basically never-ending oil. Um, not never-ending, but turned uh, basically a small jar of oil into enough oil that this lady was able to sell all of this oil to keep from losing her son into slavery and to pay off her debts and to live off the rest just by uh, one jar of oil. Uh, we see him raise someone from the dead, the Shunammite's son. Um, he raises one from the dead. Um, he purifies a pot of stew that had deadly, deadly gourds in it. That doesn't seem as wild, but that's still pretty, pretty impressive. Um, he fed 100 men with what should have fed about 10 to 20. Um, he cleansed Naaman. Um, this is one we're typically familiar with. The Syrian commander, the commander of the Syrian army, Naaman, who was a leper, he cleansed Naaman's leprosy. Um, this is one of, I think, it's probably the coolest in some ways. He, he got an iron axe head to float up out of the river. You do that, you're doing something. And uh, I thought that was really cool. But not the greatest miracle, but definitely something really interesting. And uh, the, the blind, he blinded the Syrians, and that's what we're going to be studying this evening. So, of course, I said it, Elisha did this, and he did that, and he did that. None of that's possible, of course, without God's power working through him. And we can infer by that that he was a man of great faith um, to be able to do all this by, with God's power backing him. So let's go ahead and turn there. We're going to be looking at that story in 2 Kings chapter 6 uh, for the remainder of our time. While you're turning there, this time in history, Syria is basically the thorn in Israel's side. Um, primarily Israel. I don't know that they're as, in, as uh, bad for Judah right now because remember they are split. And Through this story, we're talking about Israel and not, not Judah here. But... Uh, and it's funny because Elisha did not have much regard for the king of Israel. But nonetheless, he did, he did still help him. So 2 Kings chapter 6, starting here at verse 8. Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And, and the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not, do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. And thus he warned, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? <clears throat> so the king of Syria had been trying to ambush the king of Israel for some time now in a, in a military battle. And on more than a few occasions there, it says that he would set up an ambush and knowing that, you know, the king of Israel and his army should be coming through here, and for some reason they don't. And it's happened so many times now that he's like, what's going on? Surely somebody is, is you know, there's a spy in the camp, and somebody is relaying information to them, and they're been able to, you know, avert the issue. And he's got pretty fed up with to the point, as said, that he expects people with his, within his own camp. And back to verse 11, it says, Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Verse 12, And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, Surely he is in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. So the king's servants speak up and say, It's, it's not us. Um, there's nobody here against you. Um, who it is is Elijah. Um, he's able to tell tell the king of Israel the, the dreams that, or not the dreams, but the words that you speak in your bedchamber. And uh, they had become probably become known to Elijah, as I already alluded to, and probably through Naaman uh, being cleansed from his leprosy. He was he was a a high commander in the Syrian army. So he may have been the very one telling the king this, this information. And uh, 
Anyway, so the king of Syria demands to know where Elisha is, that he may, may get him. And uh, I'm sure he's not planning to do anything too friendly with him. Um, but he, he says that they send and get him. And uh, he finds out that, that uh, Elisha is staying in Dothan and he sends a significant army to go take care of this situation. And it's kind of humorous, uh, a flawed plan if you might uh, consider it. So he basically says, go capture the man that knows my every move. And uh, it doesn't work. He didn't realize that at the time. But it's one of those hindsight 2020 things. But anyway, the army came in by night and surrounded the city of Dothan. So it had to be, a, we don't know how big this, it wasn't the entire army of Syria. It was a significant, significant amount of people to surround a city nonetheless. And uh, we'll pick back up in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And the servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So they were actually on a, on a hill, basically, Dothan was, from what I understand. So the Syrian army was basically below them, and all around the house and the city between them was these horses and chariots and army of fire there. And uh, so Elisha's servant awoke that morning and uh, woke up to a pretty disturbing sight. And as any ordinary person would, he probably panicked and immediately went and told Elisha what was out there and uh, probably very distressed about it. And uh, Elisha, he didn't blink, twitch, or react. It's like he had ice water running through his veins. He knew this was going to happen. And uh, there wasn't any panic or fear in him. And he, he tells his servant this, to not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Um, but still at this time, his servant's not seeing anything. So he um, probably needs to be reassured of that quite a bit. And uh, Elisha then prays to God that he would open his eyes and then he does see it. Um, he sees the, the army of horses and chariots and, and the military of fire all around all around the house there to protect Elisha. Uh, 2 Kings 6, 18 says, So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike the people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. So of all that he could have done um, with this army, um, with this army of fire, they, they weren't just there for... They weren't just there for the... Uh, to scare them. I mean, they were there for whatever need be to protect Elisha. And Elisha probably could have had them all killed all at once, but he didn't. He was merciful. And he prayed prayed to God that they would simply blind, blind them as they began to basically charge the city. And uh, you can imagine the chaos that ensued upon that after, you know, basically... You can imagine just an initial charge and then all of a sudden everybody's blind. They can't see what they're doing. They don't really understand what's going on. Just an immediate shock that they were in. And it had to be quite a bit of chaos and confusion uh, for everybody at that point. And uh, at, at this time, Elisha, Elisha comes out and, and he speaks to them. I guess they done got close enough and they're wandering around enough, quiet enough that now that he can make his voice known. And uh, he talks to him here, 2 Kings 6, 19. Now Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. So it was when they had come to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and they were inside Samaria. So immediately uh, he, he leads them off, and it's... What I, what I thought about with this when he's leading these people to, to Samaria, he, I would have, I don't know if he did, but would have drug them through every briar patch, every ditch, across every, dragging them through trees and everything else the whole time. 
Um, we don't know if they could partially see or anything, but they were definitely relying on his guidance. I would have probably had some fun with that. We don't know if he did, but uh, it doesn't really matter. But I just couldn't help but think about that. And uh, of course, I lost my place in my notes. So he leads them into the capital city of, of Israel being Samaria, and that was a, a 10 to 12 mile walk. So this would have been a pretty exhausting event, um, especially blind. And if you were going through briar patches, rock piles, and everything else, they really were exhausted. And uh, after arriving, um, it, they're, they're brought into the presence of the king, still blind. The Israelite armies all surrounded them, and all of a sudden, Elisha prays that their eyes would be open, and and boom, they're open, and look where they're at. Uh, they know it's it's immediate death. They're in trouble. And uh, the first words they hear uh, in Second Kings six twenty one. Um, now, when the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, "My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them?" Uh, but he answered, "You shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with your sword and your bow?" Set food and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Then he prepared a great feast for them. And after they ate and drank, he sent them away and they went to their master. So the band of Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. This was... Uh, so King Jehoram immediately, he actually refers to uh, Elisha at this time with great respect. And he's saying, my father, my father, shall I kill him? And... Uh, Elisha shows mercy to him once more. I don't know if this was a, more of a, a military tactic or a, a wise military choice and not opening a greater can of worms um, than, than need be. But nonetheless, uh, Elisha does show mercy to these men who were all here hearing this this whole time and probably very tormented in this process. And uh, instead, he tells them to, to prepare a meal for him. And it says that they prepared a great feast. They had all kinds of stuff. They, they had their eat, their food and their drink. They sat and had a meal. And it had to be a very grateful thing. And also a very awkward situation there to be. Imagine to be, be the Syrians at this point. Um, here they were. They brought you in, into, into, sudden, into sure death. And instead they feed you a meal. And they, they provide you water. And they say, we're not going to kill you. That ha they had to have a lot of um, a lot of gratefulness in their hearts at this time, but it still had to be a very, very awkward situation. I'm sure they were ready to leave when that, whenever they were released. And uh, it says after that that the the Syrian raiders no longer um, came in and raided raided Israel after that. Now they still had wars with Syria and they still had problems with Syria, but there never was any kind of that stuff going on anymore. So that, that's basically the, the story that we're going to look at this evening. And uh, now I just want to look at a couple, couple conclusions, characteristics of Elisha. And one of the first, I think, is his faith in God. Um, and the other is his faithfulness to God. Those two points really they are, sound very the same, but they are different in, in action and in belief. But Elisha did great works by the hand of God, and there was never doubt or fear in this man's life in this story specifically but as you read through through the life of Elijah you find the same thing um, we, we don't see him re react poorly to to uh, hard situations um, one thing he prayed with anticipation that it would be answered he prayed um, with faith he prayed with understanding and um, it happened and he didn't get out of sorts when things were going bad. And you might say, well, yeah, he had, he had a supernatural connection with God at this point. Um, he, he understood what was going on. And I would counter that with yes, but in, in an application for us, we do too. It's right here. We have a direct connection to the Word of God, no different. Um, and I think a verse that is somewhat fitting to this, or at least I kept thinking about it, was 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. It says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with temptation will also make the way of escape 
that you may be able to bear it. Oh, I said this is speaking specifically about temptation. This is not speaking about being attacked by Syrian raiders and being tough through that. But it's a similar situation. I think we get the point. Um, I think we forget this a lot of times, though, because we get the shell shock, the uh, we get the surprise, and we get the the when the temptation or whatever hits you in the face. Or the trouble and that's what you focus on and it, you you get in that shock state and you you forget the you forget the other forces behind you and uh, we forget that promise that God's not going to allow us to be able to tempt allow us to be able to be tempted beyond what we're able to bear and too many times we succumb to that sin or that temptation um, because of the here and now and what's right there in our face and we don't we don't step back and we I don't step back and I don't realize that I can't overcome this. We just let it happen. But when we when we look back at Elisha's servant um, when the Syrians show up surrounding surrounding them we can relate to his situation. His reaction to trouble was completely as ours would have been um, panic, fear I'm sure there's anxiety ours would have been no different but after he saw the army of fire protecting him, I'm pretty sure all that went away. He probably had a lot more fear for that army of fire that was protecting him than he did for the, for the uh, issue that was facing him. And that, like I said, his fear and worry subsided. And we can know and be confident that we won't be pushed past what we can bear. Um, and the way out may not always be easy, but the way out of temptation will always be there. And we have to be ready and, and realize that. <clears throat> and the other point there, like I said, with, that's uh, Elijah's faith in God there, or Elisha's faith in God, and now his faithfulness to God. And I think we see that early on, like I said, when we first introduce Elisha, we see that, his faithfulness to God. Um, as Elijah throws his mantle on him and tests him to follow him, immediately and on the spot he sacrifices his his oxen that'd be like a farmer today setting his tractor on fire for a barbecue he was committed and uh he left it right there left his family behind and put everything he had into serving god and following elijah and then um uh, makes me think about that um Luke 9, 57 through 62. I'm going to turn there. We'll read that. A very fitting passage. Luke 9, 57 says, As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, talking to Jesus here, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And he said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, No one who, put, who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. I mean, Elijah is a textbook example of that. Um, can't really get any closer, I would say. Um, and a lesson can be learned there for us. A, what, or a point that I thought about is that um, just reading those two things there and Elijah's example... Uh, I think too many, well, we get caught up in our past life. We Sometimes maybe a bad part of your life or what, what was a sinful part of your life that maybe you enjoyed and you look back on it fondly and it's something maybe you hold it even special to you. That's a problem. Um, we can't be that way. We can't basically pull out our old pictures and reminisce on the good times as we might call them and say oh that was so fun tuck it up put it in your wallet put it away and go on being a christian and just reminiscing on that that that's not fit you're not fit for the service of god if that's your attitude you have to leave those things behind just like elisha did so uh as elisha and another, and another thing we can look at in his faithfulness to God was his desire to serve God there. As, uh, as Elijah was uh, preparing to be carried up and away into heaven, um, Elijah asked, asks Elisha, he said, what shall I do for you? You know, basically name something and I'll do it for you. 
And his request wasn't anything, I wouldn't call this a selfish request, it was a request of, of, of high merit really that a double portion of Elijah's spirit would be put out on him so he could, so he could go and do and be more. And uh, he got just that. And uh, in all the writing about Elisha, I, I haven't seen, you can read through, and if you find something, correct me, but I haven't seen anything negative about the character of Elijah or about the works of Elijah. Or Elisha. Um, I think he's a very stand-up stand up man through the, through, the, through the account we have of him. And, uh, you know, Hebrews 11, it's a very familiar chapter to us. We talk about all of the, the faithful men and women there in, mentioned in that chapter. And we don't read his name specifically, but we, there is a section there where it says, talking about the actions of the prophets. Um, there's a few of those things in there that Elisha did do. Um, I'll leave that as a go home and read it yourself hint there. But uh, there are some things in there that, that Elisha had a part in. And uh, we, can read his, we can't read his name there specifically, but we see his works there. And he was truly a faithful servant to God. And that should also be our goal. And one other uh, thing that um, I think we can draw from that, from that story specifically is uh, seeing beyond what's in front of us. And I've already talked about that a little bit. But, uh, you know, we're often so focused on problems in our lives that we, uh, we forget we have the solution. We get overcome with emotion a lot of times. We get emotional about everything. Emotions are good sometimes, but they're... Emotions are not good choice makers. Reason is a good choice maker. The Word of God is a good choice maker. Your emotions are not good choice makers. But uh, we have to be able to see past the problem that we have in front of us. Um, Elijah saw the spiritual realm, the horsemen of the flaming fire of Israel. He had no worry about what was going to happen. He could see that. But too often we can't see... Um, the solutions that we have. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We have to put our faith in God. We, if we could see the spiritual realm, what we read here, we would see a host of angels and of faithful witnesses that are cheering us on and are hoping the best for us and wanting us to succeed. And we also see Jesus, our King and our Savior, seated at, seated at the right hand of God. He is our solution. He is our answer. And uh, He's done the work for us. I think if we look, uh, if we keep these things in our vision and in our mind when we realize it, when we're being tempted, when we look back at that and we remember that, I think we'll have a faith more like Elisha's and seeing, seeing beyond the physical situation and seeing on through uh, the ability to endure. I'm not saying we can go conquer the world or do anything physically like that, but we can endure hardships. We can overcome sin and we can overcome temptation um, through those things. And we can do it faithfully. So that's what I have for us this evening. I hope it's been a beneficial study it's been a very interesting one to me um i'm not a good storyteller as you can tell but um it's always enjoyable to go through these stories and uh, really learn something from them and be able to pull some some insights about the characters and how how they how they were faithful to god and other things that we can learn thanks for watching this video i know what you're thinking i don't want to miss another video from this channel in order to avoid that Click on the red button down there, subscribe, and then click the bell icon. Not only will that alert you each time a new video is uploaded to the channel, it will also help spread the channel to other people's awareness. So, go ahead, do it, like right now, click on it.